Minister, Mr Chair. I call Jacinda Ardern. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair, um, and I want to thank my colleague for setting out um, so clearly at each stage of this bill Labor's um, position on um, this piece of legislation. There are um, more frequent than I would um, like uh, occasions in this House where we're presented with what I would term to be um, bad law um, addressing critical issues. Uh, and by critical issues, issues that become highly politicised because there's a real drive from the community um, for politicians to respond um, to issues where harm can be done. This is an example um, of an area like that. Harm can and has been done in this space. There is a need to respond, um, but our concern is that this response is not the right one and yet anyone who stands and opposes the bill then becomes wedged as not being concerned about the issue. Um, and that is almost the worst of all scenarios. Um, I would wager that we will be back here debating something in this space again. There will be some um, misinterpretation of the law, um, some 14-year-old sentenced to a term of imprisonment, um, something which will lead us to reconsider this piece of legislation. Um, you can put that on I predict um, now. Mr Chair, when it comes to principles of justice and coming to part two, because we are in this part debating some significant pieces of um, legislation that already exist around the Harassment Act, um, and there are amendments primarily to the Crimes Act 1961, um, they, they are essentially amendments to existing pieces of law. I think it's important when considering amendments to such significant and well-established pieces of law, we need to consider a couple of really important justice principles. Are we making consistent and are we making clear legislation? My concern is that with the regime that this bill sets up by both amending um, sub uh, existing parts of um, the law uh, alongside setting up a new criminal regime, that actually things will become confused um, and that we may even have um, a, a two-tier system. For example, um, it's my understanding that the uh, new penalties around um, uh, facing up to two that were debated in part one, the two year maximum um, prison sentence and the fine of up to $50,000 has the ability to apply to um, anyone of the age 14 and above. That's my understanding of how the law um, will be applied potentially. Um, uh, and if that's not the case, then I would have thought the Minister wouldn't have had a problem with Labour's SOP, confirming that actually it should sit at the age of criminal responsibility, which in New Zealand is 17. Given that was voted down, let's assume, therefore, that that regime can apply to a child as young as 14. Let's assume that. Can we, therefore, assume that there's an assumption around existing legislation with this bill subsequently amends around the harassment um, uh, around the um, Crimes Act, the Summary Offences Act and the Harassment Act, that the same will apply? Is, is that the assumption? Um, if so, some clarity on that would be incredibly useful. And the reason which Labor is focused on the age of criminal responsibility and how this bill will apply is because that's where the evidence base suggests that actually applying criminal regimes that sit around um, convictions and sentencing is not a helpful way to deal with children and young people. In fact, I probably don't need to present evidence that seems on the face of it to be a natural assumption. If a child, and I call them a child because they are, if a 14-year-old posts something on Facebook, which could be deemed uh, under this law to um, be in contravention of what this law sets out, do we seriously think a prison sentence is the best way to deal with that? I mean, really, and yet that is what we are setting out in this um, legislation. Why is it that even this government has focused on using diversion more, um, community-based sentencing more, um, has focused on using restorative justice quietly, but they are doing it, and it's because it works. It is a better way to address criminal offending in this space than what this bill is presenting. This bill is presenting a political solution not a practical solution. It's also probably going down the track of producing an easier one. For instance, making an amendment to the Harassment Act, as um, part two does, which um, uh, then adds to the Harassment Act. For the purposes of this act, a person also harasses another person if a, 
he or she engages in a pattern of behaviour that is directed against that other person, and B, that pattern of behaviour includes doing any specified act to the other person that is one continuing act carried out over a period of time, Mr Chair. Sandra Ardern. Thank you, Mr Chair. Well, by definition, that's harassment. <laughs> by definition, that is harassment. And that is the reason why the regulatory impact statement specifically says it was probably unnecessary to make an amendment to those acts in order for cyberbullying, as it's been termed here, to be covered. So it's pretty much a superficial amendment, which again speaks to the notion of this being a political response rather than a practical response. But it does go on. There is something specific in the amendment to the harassment, specific to um, the issue of, of cyberbullying, as it were. For the purposes of subsection 3, continuing act includes a specified act done on any one occasion that continues to have effect over a protracted period, for example, where offensive material about a person is placed in electronic media and remains there for a protracted, protracted period. A specific example there, specific to electronic um, uh, mechanisms for harassment. Again, already covered probably by the legislation. It's being written there in black and white to make it really specific, but I, I would have thought that um, that was unnecessary. Have we now, however, by putting in that level of specificity, meant that we've created a higher, um, uh, sorry, a lower threshold for electronic means of harassment than any other form? Uh, because I don't think that's the kind of consequence that we want from a bill like this, but it may well be what we have inadvertently done. So again, if they already existed, then why would we have focused on that track? Well, because the alternative to part two, Mr Chair, is actually probably um, not legislative of all. Make an assumption that actually we're covered, get the legal advice that we're covered with the existing mechanisms um, set out under the Crimes Act, and then move on to what would actually make a difference. For instance, did the Children's Commissioner, were they engaged at any point in this legislation to, to talk to young people and children about what would make a difference in their space and in their world to this issue. Because I bet if you went to a group of children and said, would new offences under the Harassment Act and creating a maximum two-year penalty or $50,000 fine stop cyberbullying in your world, do you think? I would wager they would probably say absolutely not. And I'd wager that if you actually asked them what would make a difference, they would focus on the harm done in peer groups because that is where the harm is primarily done. And if you're focusing on peer groups and harm within peer groups, thank you, Minister, for rolling your eyes um, while you're in the chair. I look forward to your wholehearted contribution on this debate, which so far has been somewhat limited. Then you probably would have gone to the Ministry of Education and said, what do you do, what do, you do in this space already? What do you do with, sight, with bullying within your school environment? because we are essentially mirroring that at an electronic level and trying to tackle that same issue, but in a different medium. And I'm sure they probably would have come to, uh, back to the Ministry of Education with some ideas that were very much based on principles about uh, restorative justice within that peer group and, an envi and environment. Instead, we do what Parliament always does. We respond to pressure by slapping in a law and assuming that everything will be fixed because of it. We dust our hands off and we walk away. And that is a cop-out to this issue. It is bigger than amendments to the Harassment Act. It's bigger than amendments to the Crimes Act. And I know, I know that Paula Bennett knows that. No, government can't solve everything. And yet it's pretending it can with this piece of legislation. It's pretending it can with law alone. And we know it is more complicated than that. And I'd like it to be on record that the Minister just said that that contribution was a load of rubbish because I have no doubt that even when this law has passed, we will still be debating this issue. We will still be debating this issue once this law has passed. So, Mr Speaker, um, I want to just recap. I do um, would really like to see the Minister respond to some of the questions around the age of responsibility. I wouldn't mind her comment on if this is the right thing to do, why did the UK look at this issue and not do it? Why did the UK, when uh, it tackled, because we've seen some of the dreadful cases in the UK, why, when they looked at this issue, did they avoid criminalisation? Instead, they went down the path of greater education and using existing law with serious threats by adults needed to be dealt with. The same with Australia. 
The same with Australia, because this law focuses on what to do when harm has already happened, instead of trying to prevent harm, particularly amongst <coughs> young people and children, uh, which would have been a much better approach. I call 